Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Xander's Facts. Hello, everybody. Welcome into the latest edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander, and this is episode 78 of the Xander's Facts podcast here on Wednesday, October 12th, 2022. Thank you all for listening. It is a big podcast, episode 78. You might have looked ahead and saw how long this podcast is. It is very long, but that is because there are a lot of facts on this podcast. This week is our NBA season preview because the NBA season begins on Tuesday of next week. And for that, we of course had to bring in our Xander Sfax NBA analyst, the one and only Hillbilly. He joined the podcast this week. We broke down all 30 teams in the NBA. We talked about all the facts. That you need to know to get you ready for Tuesday when the NBA season begins. So we're going to get to that in just a second. But before we do, I did just want to remind you that if you like the facts, if you've liked all the facts we've had previously, if you think you're going to like the facts on this episode of the podcast, remember to follow this podcast, the Xander's Facts Podcast, download this episode, episode 78, rate and review the podcast. They go on all your socials. Check out Xander's Facts there. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'm all over those. At Xander's Facts. That's Xander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends. Spread the facts! Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends. Tell them to listen to any of our past 77 episodes, including last week's podcast when we did our one month to the midterms. A little midterm preview with a month to go. Check that out from last week, and also check out Xander's Weekend Facts, which has all the facts that you need every Sunday morning, a compilation of the top facts from the past week in newsletter form. Check it out. That is in this episode's description, and check out the Xander's Facts link tree for all the Xander's Facts links that you need, and also Xander'sFacts.com. You know, the thing I told you about last week, which is not done yet, but I already announced it, is coming along pretty nicely. That's going to be up and running too pretty soon, along with the Xander's Facts shop. Get hype. I'm hype. It's going to be awesome when we launch that in a few weeks. So keep checking the podcast because I'm going to be announcing on this podcast when it launches. Xander'sFacts.com. Oh my gosh. So let's get to this week's podcast episode. As I mentioned, we brought in our Xander's Facts NBA analyst, Hillbilly, to break down what is going to happen in the upcoming NBA season? Of course, last year, the Warriors won the title, but there has been a lot of off-season news, particularly recently involving the Boston Celtics and extremely recently with the Golden State Warriors. So we talked about all of that. We previewed all 30 teams. And I think it's safe to say, recording this after we recorded the interview, that both Hillbilly and I are pretty excited about what's going to happen this NBA season. There's a lot of unknowns, but there's a lot of intrigue. So it's very interesting. It's also very long. However, Ugh. we kind of have it split up. So first off, we did the Eastern Conference teams. Then we did the Western Conference teams. So we kind of have, you know, that's a break point. And then at the end, we did our season long predictions. So we kind of split it up into three parts. So it is very long, but it's got a lot of facts. Just to warn you. Santa warned you. All right, let's get to it. Episode 78 of the Xander's Facts Podcast. It's our 2022-2023 NBA season preview with our Xander's Facts NBA analyst, Hillbilly. Let's get to it as the Xander's Facts Podcast continues. Xander's Facts. All right, welcome back to the Xander's Facts Podcast, everyone. We are on episode 78, and it is middle of October. Wednesday, October 12th is when this podcast is coming out, and that means basketball is back, professional basketball. And that can only mean one thing. Tell me, tell me. That our own, our own senior Xander's Facts NBA analyst, Hillbilly, has made his return to the podcast for the first time in months hillbilly how are you i'm i'm fantastic and i'm just breathless with excitement oh my gosh i bet you are i know i am the nba season begins next week on tuesday october 18th 
Last season, as you may have known, we talked about this podcast, the Gold State Warriors came back to the top of the league after a couple years in mediocrity to win their fourth championship in the era of Steph, Clay, Draymond. We'll see how long that era lasts. We'll talk about that for a little bit. They won over the Boston Celtics in six games in the finals. So will the Warriors repeat? Who will challenge them for the title? And who is just going to be tanking for our boy, Wenbin Yamba? We have got all your professional basketball questions answered on this podcast. We are going to break down all 30 teams, give you our picks for who's going to make the playoffs and who's going to win the finals and who's going to be the most valuable player in the NBA this season. Here we go. So let's start with the Eastern Conference. The 15 teams in the Eastern Conference, the Heat were the ones who finished first in the regular season, but it was the Celtics who beat the Heat in seven games. We're going to get to them in a little bit, though, because we're going to start from the bottom of last year's standings, and that includes the Orlando Magic Hillbilly, who finished last last year, but they added Paolo Bancaro, who the Magic shut down after two games in the summer league because they were like, all right, we know, this guy is pretty good. So I know we're not going to you know, the Magic are going to be the Magic this year, and they're not going to be too great. But what do you think about my boy Paolo this year? Well, Paolo, I, you know, they had him in two games, and in those two games, he really did, he showed that he, what he was doing in college translates right over to the NBA. And even though they are preseason games, or it, it's still, you know, he, he's, he's ready to go. I think that the... Um, Injury that they've got with Suggs now is a little concerning. Um, he just doesn't seem to be able to get a good start to his career. And yeah, they, they've still just got a lot of injuries on that team. They're still so young. I think they're probably going to be one of the front runners for the Frenchman that we will talk about later. But you know, they, they're going to be exciting to watch. It'll be fun to watch Ben Caro and see how he really does translate to the NBA. Ben Caro is going to be a lot of fun to watch. And now to 14... Actually, the bottom two teams of the East are kind of teams that are really young and whose futures look really bright, I think. The Pistons are 14th. They finished just above the Magic last year, one game above. They hold 2021's number one overall pick in Cade Cunningham, who had a pretty decent year. The Pistons, of course, I mean, they're not going to do anything special like the Magic. But what do you like about Cade Cunningham in his second year in the, in the league? Well, I'm much more excited about Detroit. I mean, they're definitely going to be a team that I'm going to be tuning into every time they're on TV because they are going to be fun to watch. Cade Cunningham had a really strong finish to his rookie season and looks to be just just what they thought he'd be when they drafted him at number one. And then this draft, it looks like they knocked it out of the park uh, with Duran and Jaden Ivey. I mean, Jaden Ivey really could be the kind of player that can just break down any defense in front of him, kind of like a John Morant style player. You know, maybe not quite at that level, but who knows? And he looks the part. Coupling that with Cade Cunningham and then Duren, who looks fantastic, um, is a center that they picked up. They're really on the rise. They've got a lot of other really interesting players on there, too. Beef Stew, Isaiah Stewart. What do you say? Beef Stew. And Sadiq Bey is the kind of guy that can come out and score 40 points on any given night. Um, so they do have a lot of, uh, interesting players on there. It'd be fun to watch. They're just, they're young. They're still learning. The defense is probably still going to be something they're working on, but it'll be a lot of fun to watch. And they could, they could maybe make a shot at the play in. I mean, you never know. We'll see. The next team we're going to talk about though, I do not think has a shot at making the play. And that is the Indiana Pacers. I mean, they just, they're just not looking that great this year, Hillbilly. Again, they're not, and they're kind of stuck in limbo too. They they should have traded Miles Turner by now. You know, it it seems like they're in a tank, and this is obviously, as we'll talk about later, the year of all years to tank. But they still have all these players on their roster that they need to have gotten rid of by now, and I'm not sure exactly what they're trying to do. It, it looks like they're going to wind up with just really bad lottery odds, but in the lottery. And that'll be rough because you want the top odds in the lottery this year. So number 12, number 12 is interesting. The Wizards, they have Bradley Beal, who's really good. They have Kristaps Porzingis. But after that, and they're still 12th. I mean, like a team with Bradley Beal should not be doing this bad, I don't think, Hillbilly. 
Yeah, Bradley Peel didn't really have the he didn't really have the best season last year. And it, it's starting to look a little bit like you know, he is a max contract player. And it's he's such a liability on defense that if his offense isn't really carrying the load very efficiently, it becomes tough to justify that kind of salary. Um, and then the the rest of the Wizards, they're just kind of where they always are. I mean, this is where the Wizards always are. They are not going to get top odds to get a top pick in the lottery, but they have no chance of competing for a championship. Zero. That's impressive. So it's, and that's the way it is with the Wizards every year. Rough times in Washington. The District of Columbia. Now let's go up 95. We've got the New York Knicks, the Knickerbockers, who a couple years ago, it was the 2021 playoffs. They played the Hawks. They won a game. The New Yorkers were partying out in the streets, and then they fall back to irrelevancy this year, which I believe you predicted when you said that a Tom Thibodeau team is just going to get, they're just going to get tired because they are worked too hard. Could they not have that happen this year when Thibodeau is still their coach? I think it'll probably just get worse. As they, they, I don't know what their real identity is here. Picking up Jalen Brunson was a big deal, and they spent a whole lot of money on him, and they worked really hard to get him. I mean, they gave his dad a job on staff, so that's a get that dough. But yeah, Jalen is, is Brunson as good as he is. He's an undersized guard that you're putting a ton of money into, and Barrett, RJ Barrett hasn't really popped quite the way that. They need him to offensively, at least. And then they've still got Thibodeau just, you know, he will play the veterans as long as he possibly can and just wear the team down. The Knicks are, again, they're just kind of right where they where they always are. Irrelevant. It's sad for New York, too. And it's inexcusable given what the free agents would like to go there. But Well, when you've got an owner like James Dolan, I mean. Ugh. That's that's it. There you go. Not the worst owner in the league, though, apparently. How about that? Uh, well, at least not the most publicly bad. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if you knew every single thing about every owner oh, if Dolan well, came out the worst. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to the teams now who did not miss the play-in. They got to the play-in, so they didn't miss playoff basketball entirely. But starting at 10 is a team that has major questions in the Charlotte Hornets. They had this whole coaching thing at the beginning of the offseason where they which led to them rehiring Steve Clifford because one coach, I don't remember who his name was, but he backed out of the job. So that whole thing happened. You've got LaMelo Mall, you've got Gordon Hayward, but he's always injured. Miles Bridges is gone because bad stuff happened with him. So I mean there's not much beyond LaMelo Ball and Gordon Hayward and that might be tough for the Hornets this year. Yeah, um, I think that the Hornets are probably the last of the bad teams that we're going to talk about. I think they're actually the last of the teams that I would say have like zero chance of winning a championship in the East. Uh, you know, once you once you go past them, things start to get really, really tough, really quick. Yeah, the Hornets are going to stink. Miles Bridges obviously isn't coming back. Lamelo Ball, as great as he is, doesn't have anybody to throw the ball to. They're talking about trading Gordon Hayward, which they can't get him to play anyways. Um, it's just another year of proof that Michael Jordan was a much better player than he is a general manager slash owner. Hasn't been great in Charlotte. So Hillbilly's got nine teams who at least have a small chance of winning the championship of the Eastern Conference. And that starts with the ninth team from last year's Eastern Conference, the Cleveland Cavaliers, who made an offseason splash getting Donovan Mitchell. They had to give up a lot to get him, but they got him. They've also got Darius Garland, Evan Mobley, who were playing really well last year. The Cavaliers were doing really well early last year. They fell back to where we thought they would. But, I mean, what does the addition of Donovan Mitchell do, the, do to this team? I, I think it's enormous, and I, I think the Cavs could be really fantastic next year. I mean, I, that's why I, they're mm. right on that last group of teams where if we see what is unfortunately the usual number of injuries in the postseason, where it takes out more than half of the teams, um, lose a star player, they're that type of team where they just could 
if they put it all together right at the right moment, they've got all the talent in the world. They've got these two huge guys down low. Remember when they started to trail off last year, that coincided with Jared Allen getting injured, who is a legitimate all-star center, a defensive force. And then Evan Mobley, who is out of this world defensively in his first year. And then you had Darius Garland coupled now with Donovan Mitchell. Those are two guys that can get past any defender you've put in front of them. So the defense can just never really rest. So it's it looks like they've really got it covered on all ends. They just don't have a lot of depth. And you are still relying on some really young players like Garland and Mobley and Allen. So, you know, probably not this year, but you know, they they've got the talent level where if the right players took the right steps in their production and in their development, they could have a really, really big year. Was so one year away, you say. Nice try, buddy. Yeah, more than likely they're still a year or two away if things go well. But but they've got such a good amount of talent. If Evan Mobley all of a sudden really gets some good playmaking skills, it could make a huge difference for them. The Cavaliers might be a little exciting. How about that? First non-LeBron Cavaliers team that is exciting in quite some time, I would say. Yeah, and exciting for the future. They they own their draft picks generally, except you know for what they gave up for Donovan uh, Mitchell, and they've got just a really a bunch of really young players that should just get better. Donovan Mitchell's not an old man either; he's still progressing himself. So they're an exciting team to watch. So that's the ninth team from last year in the East. The eighth team are the Atlanta Hawks, who made the playoffs last year. They lost. 4-1 in the first round to the one-seed Heat. They made the Eastern Conference Finals, though, to, I guess, 2021, so last year. They had Trey Young. They still have Trey Young, of course. And they add DeJounte Murray. That looks to be an upgrade on paper. They've also got DeAndre Hunter, who's hopefully going to be back and healthy. Because the Hawks, they looked really good in 2021. This year, they kind of trailed off. They were eighth. But what do you think about Atlanta this year? Atlanta, again, is, is another, they're another part of the reason why the East is so tough and why at least two or three really good teams are going to be in the play in tournament because Atlanta got a lot better this year, too. I think that the, the pickup that they made is just, it's fantastic. He fits perfectly, you know, a defense first guard, but that also has a lot of good offensive skill. I think that coupled with Trey Young, who is a, probably the biggest liability on defense in the NBA. If not, you know, he's in that group of players that are just awful. Awful. It really helps balance out that backcourt. And they they look like they're excited, ready to go. It's DeAndre Hunter, like you said, that is just so critical there because they really have to have him be able to handle the big wings that are on the tough teams in the playoffs defensively. And he's got to also just get a He's got to get his shot back and get some offense going. The Hawks could be another interesting team in the East. And seven last year, just the most interesting team for the last few years, the Brooklyn Nets, who got swept by the Celtics this year. But this year, coming in, Kevin Durant is healthy. Kyrie Irving doesn't have any more restrictions. Ben Simmons looks like he's going to play. We'll see what happens. But I don't know if this is, you know, too crazy to say, but I would say that since Durant and Irving came to the Nets, this is probably the best chance they have to win a championship because all of them, I mean, well, something's going to come up probably because it right. always does with Kyrie, but just looking at it right now, I mean, yeah. they don't have any issues. It's incredible. I think their best chance to win a championship was their first year before all this bad stuff happened. You know, before they just got totally, I don't, I, you know, from what the reporter who does uh, for ESPN, I think it's Purnell, just described it as like the saddest thing he had ever seen covering the NBA was covering the Nets last year. Nobody wanted to go to work. Everybody hated it there. And I think it's pretty tough to change that culture. I don't think that the recipe for changing that culture is bringing Ben Simmons in, the guy who won't dunk from one foot out, even though he's 6'10". So, you know, it's, it's tough to imagine things clicking, but you never know. I mean, obviously, the amount of talent on the team is just incredible. They're deep. They have, you know, one of the very best players in the world in Kevin Durant. Yeah, they're a team that I wouldn't 
if if all of a sudden all three of the big guys there decided they were tuned in, there's no reason they can't be the number one team in the NBA. I mean, they obviously have as much talent as anybody. But you could also see things going completely nuclear. I mean, like negative wins because they get them taken away by the NBA. They're so bad. <laughs> Whoops. You know, because you could just see it. Like if it implodes again, if something else happens, you could just see it be really ugly because it's already imploded a couple of times. Interesting to watch. It'll be nice if they got their act together, but I, I wouldn't count on it. Yeah, that's the thing. They're so interesting because they have... Kevin Durant, who's one of the best talents we've ever seen. Kyrie Irving is really good when he plays basketball. We've seen Ben Simmons play well. That was a while back. But they have so much talent. The issue is that Kevin Durant literally wanted the coach and the GM fired this offseason. And that didn't happen. It, it didn't happen. They didn't get fired, but he did say it, and they did find out about it, as everybody in the world did. And I think it's really, really hard to get back from something like that. But they've got the talent to do it. I mean, remember, Ben Simmons wasn't just a good player. He was all NBA. I mean, he's defensive player of the year caliber defender with a you know really amazing playmaking skills. He just can't shoot. And, you know, there does, he doesn't seem to be in a position to play basketball mentally right now. And it's, it, I, it's just difficult to see on both sides how, like, if you're Ben Simmons and you need to get your head back in a better place, you know, you go to Brooklyn right now <laughs> with Kyrie Irving and yeah. Kevin Durant. It just doesn't seem like a recipe or, well, we'll see. We, we will see. With the Brooklyn Nets. And another team I think we might see is the Chicago Bulls, who finished sixth last year, which was kind of interesting because we talked about this last year before the season. They bring in Lonzo Ball, DeMar DeRozan, they have Zach Levine, now Alex Caruso. They put all these guys together. How does that mesh? It went fine, I think, last year. They finished sixth, but Lonzo Ball's going to be out for, I think, a long while to start the season. So what's up with the Chicago Bulls? Who knows with Lonzo Ball? And he's critical because, you know, it was great. The season that DeMar DeRozan had was fantastic. And, you know, there's no reason to think that he shouldn't be close to that level again. They've got plenty of scoring on that team, but they've got problems. When you've got a center like Vucevic that's not really a defender, it You've got to make up for that elsewhere. And you don't do that with the Rosen and you don't do that with Levine. So Caruso, who you talked about, and Ball are just absolutely critical. And when those guys went down last year, the Bulls, who were number one and number two for a while in the early part of the season, they just crashed. And now with Lonzo Ball, it was supposed to be a one-month injury back in January. Yeah. And it just keeps getting worse and worse to the point where I, I don't think we have a timetable. No, I don't think so, because I think he got surgery very recently. And they need him as like the tip of the spear on defense to at least give him a fighting chance. Without him, I don't – they're going to be a team that probably slides and are in the play-in, I would imagine. At the, yeah, probably in the play-in. Mm -hmm. Especially when you've got all these teams that look to be improved in the Eastern Conference, too. Right. I mean, both Atlanta and Cleveland that we just talked about, and, and Brooklyn, you would think they'd be better than last year, but we'll Maybe. see. We'll see. This next team, I want to see if you agree with this, because I have been listening, reading some other NBA previews, which are not as fact-filled as this one, by the way. Gash facts. But a lot of people seem to be a little high on the Toronto Raptors. Now, the Raptors, you might remember, Beat the Warriors in the finals. That was, of course, with Kawhi. But they have OG Ananobi, Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Vliet. All the players who, fin who went 48-34 and 34 last year, lost 4-2 to to the Sixers in the first round, are back. They add Otto Porter Jr. What do you think about this Raptors team? Are they improved this year? Well, they, they, hopefully they will be just by the law of averages helping them with injuries. Last year was ridiculous what happened to them. And they've just, they have had it rough. I mean, they, you know, they didn't even get to play in Toronto all year. But I, actually, I can't remember if that was last year or the year before. 
now COVID's got my head fuzzy, but you know, regardless. Yeah. And I know last year they had injury after injury to the point where apparently Nick Nurse, their coach, was meeting players the day of game day. Players that were going to play minutes in the NBA because they they were just bringing people in. So hopefully if they're healthy because yeah they've got I mean Scotty Barnes was rookie of the year and deserved it by a mile and it was in a it was in a class that had some incredible rookies in it and he still stood out as the obvious pick he looks like he's just going to be absolutely incredible he's like another Magic Johnson almost yeah. um, just with that size except that he's got really good defensive skills and you look at their roster they're all about six eight six nine incredibly athletic that is they're a switching nightmare the only exception is is van vliet who's also very good defensively for his size so that's you know and they're they're young og ananobi is just kind of getting better and better every year there's every reason to think that if everybody's healthy they should be contending in the east i think because I, I think Scotty Barnes is just going to go through the roof this year. Yeah, I didn't even mention him. I mean, they've got a ton of, not names that are household names, but still, like, really good players the Raptors have. Yeah, Masai Ujiri really knows what he's doing. He is probably the best evaluator of talent in the NBA. How about that? And they will be playing full-time in Toronto this year. I think they might have played full-time in Toronto last year. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, my brain is fuzzy with COVID, too, so I, I don't know about that. But let's go to the top four from last year's Eastern Conference and start with the Philadelphia 76ers, who, of course, have Joel Embiid. They beat the Raptors in the first round last year, lost to the Heat in the conference semifinals, and a lot of that might have, been, might have had to do with Joel Embiid was injured in the playoffs last year. This is going to be the full, first full season, though, for Embiid and James Harden. They've also got Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris, other big names. But I got to say, if James Harden's going to win a championship, doesn't it like have to be now while he's with a player like Joel Embiid? Yeah, and while he's with a player like Tyrese Maxey, too, and Tobias Harris, who he might be overpaid, but... He is an effective offensive player in the NBA. With all that stuff around him, I think it's kind of perfect for Harden. He doesn't have to do the grunt work of scoring. You know, just making sure that he's keeping the offense flowing is what he can do now. He's got plenty of other guys on there that can score, put up some big numbers. And I think Embiid has got a chip on his shoulder for not winning the MVP last year. And I think he's probably ready to really make some moves. So his problem, though, is you mentioned he was injured in the playoffs last year. He's injured in the playoffs every single year. He always is. And you just got to think that after a while, it's something about the way he plays basketball. That if you're going to go through an 82-game season, by the end of it, he is going to be beat up. I mean, I wish it wasn't true because I love watching him play. That's the thing. I mean, Embiid's incredible. He could be an MVP. He just needs to stay healthy. If he stayed healthy, that Miami series is a lot closer in the conference semifinals, you know? Yeah, and they've got these young players that are just really ready to explode. I mean, you look at, like, Tyrese Maxey, and that's a kid that was, I, I forget, but he was number two or number three in the league last year in three-point shooting percentage. It's a fact. And he was shooting a lot of when I think a lot of people think of Tyrese Maxey, they think of the kind of jitterbug guard that can just get past everybody because he can. But he's one of the best shooters in the league. Coupling that with Harden, they're they're set. They've got a really good team. It's just whether or not they can stay healthy, which is a very big if. That that is the big question for Philly. Now let's go to number three, Hillbilly's finals pick once again this year, as we all know. The Milwaukee Bucks. With, I mean, I will be honest with you, Hillbilly. If Chris Middleton is healthy, the Milwaukee Bucks make the NBA Finals. I mean, I like, I don't know if anybody can deny that. Like, if Chris Middleton is healthy, the Bucks beat the Celtics because that series with the seven games, they beat the Heat, and I think they go to the Finals. Yeah. And I don't think that Golden State was really equipped for Giannis either. Not that anybody really is, but I, he'd foul Draymond out in a minute. You know, but, oh, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable that I think it's, there's a real consensus that the Bucks would have won that series. 
Um, I mean, even uh, Bill Simmons, the Boston Celtics fan, mm-hmm. it doesn't mince any words with that. I mean, it's they clearly would have won that series. Um, they had them by the throat, and then they just ran out of gas. Giannis is not used to playing 40-something minutes a game, and he the way he plays all out on every single possession, you can't do that. No one can. And without Middleton, that's their problem. And that's the issue they've got this year. I mean, God forbid anybody gets injured because they can't take any injuries. They're, 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 they probably have the least amount of depth of any playoff team you'll see. That was a fact. And they also are going to start somebody, probably Grayson Allen, who is going to probably be the worst starting player on any of the really elite contending teams. Well, he's just going to trip people, so, you know, not good. Disrespectful! He's not, yeah, I mean, he's kind of, I guess he has to do that stuff to, you know, get by, and, you know, good for him, he's making a good living, but but I don't think he really belongs on a playoff, starting on a playoff roster. But when they're healthy, Giannis is so clearly the best player in the NBA, and he is probably, well, it seems as though he has a chip on his shoulder from not winning last year, because I think he just expects to every year. I, they're going to be really tough. If, if everybody's healthy, they are mm-hmm. my pick to win it. Well, of course they are. But <laughs> I mean, oh, well, I didn't. I didn't feel like I was spoiling anything. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people's pick though. They're they have the second highest odds according to whatever odds maker I'm looking at right here on the internet. I mean, there are a lot of people's pick to win because, as you say, if they're healthy, Giannis is just incredible and. He's not going to slow down for years. He's getting better. Yeah, and you know, Middleton's had a good track record of being healthy in his career so far. So there's every reason to think that that was just an anomaly. I've also got guys like Drew Holiday, Brooke Lopez, who you don't want to get injured either. Yeah, and Lopez really is critical to that team, too. If I was the Bucs with his back problems, I would be playing Lopez the least amount I possibly could. And I would be aggressively shopping right now for a center that can just take a lot of the minutes off of them. Because Bobby Portis is a good backup, but I think it'd be really nice to have a little bit more back there. So, Wide eyes, Bobby Portis. So that's the Bucks, number three. Number two is the team that went to the NBA Finals last year, the Boston Celtics. Who beat the Nets? They just went through the Bucks. They beat the Heat by one shot in the conference finals. And then they lose to the Warriors in the NBA finals when they basically just ran out of gas, it looked like. But the beginning of that season last year was not, they were, you know, 500 team, it looked like. They had a new head coach, Ime Udoka, but he got things turned around like midway through the season and they made a huge run to the finals. The thing is, though, this was the big offseason news a couple weeks ago. Ime Udoka's been suspended for the entire season, so he's out. Joe Mazzulla, who's highly touted, was his top assistant, so he takes over. But the Celtics, actually, the Celtics have top odds on the site for the NBA championship this year. But I've got to think, Hillbilly, that that coaching change and all the whatever happened there has got to have an impact on this team yeah it's well it's got to have some kind of an impact it's tough to tell what it is but the celtics are playing it as stupidly as i think they possibly can i mean they need to just tell people what happened i guess unless i maybe the reason they're not telling people is because they don't want to you know the victims of whatever happened i guess if they are victims um their names had come out and that's tough for them. And I, I understand that, but to the extent that they can being secretive about it just means people keep talking about it and it just keeps going and going and going rather than just getting, getting past it. And it just doesn't seem like they've gotten past it. They've also had some huge injuries to start the season. You know, as we talked about before the NBA finals, I believe that we accurately predicted almost exactly what happened in the NBA finals was that the Boston Celtics were going to run out of gas. Spitting the truth. They were playing crazy minutes in the Miami series and in the Bucks series. 
crazy minutes. Oh, well, the Miami series, Game 7, they blew that huge lead. I mean, yeah, they ran out of gas there. They do, because they're playing such crazy minutes. And as we talked about last year, when you are that exhausted, that leads to turnovers. And it was just killing them. They couldn't, Jalen Brown couldn't dribble the ball without somebody taking it away from them. The problem that they have, they you know, so they pick up Malcolm Brogdon to try to help with that. And that's great. I think Malcolm Brogdon's a great fit there. But then Robert Williams gets injured. The Time Lord. Uh, um, the Time Lord. Again, he is injured. He mm. is going to be out until I think it's at least January. And it's the same knee that he had injured last year. That's not looking good for him. Then they pick up uh, Gallinari. He's out for the entire season. So they really don't have anybody to play at center right now, except for Al Horford, who's like 57 years old at this point. I mean, I love Al Horford. He's, he's great. But they cannot play him like 36, 37 minutes a game in the regular season and expect him to be around in the playoffs. And they're going to have the same problem. They're just going to be exhausted when it comes down to it. And then, you know, with the malaise of, you know, whatever is going on with the coach, it's not good for the Celtics. But they have a ton of talent on that team. And, you know, they fought as hard as they could last year. So who knows what they could do. Yeah. And I, I just think that the coaching change eliminates their path to the finals. Because we saw Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, this team, play under Brad Stevens, and they didn't get to the finals. Now, of course, you know, past years, whatever. But it really looked like Ime Udoka made a huge, I don't know, what was it, culture change, like in the middle yep. of the season, that just totally flipped the switch and turned them around. And now they don't have him this year. They have a top assistant. I mean, maybe now, maybe once the switch was switched, it doesn't matter as much. You know, I mean, like he, he discovered the magic formula. I mean, the Celtics in the second half of last year were one of the greatest teams of all time during that period. They were just destroying opponents by, I mean, their average win was by something like 20 points during that period. It was just crazy what they were doing. It's the truth. And a lot of it was just on defense. They were just shutting it down, having Marcus Smart playing point and then having Robert Williams taking him out of the center spot and just having him rove around, just destroying people defensively. He really, they, they got it. Um, and it was just a shame that they didn't have the depth to pull it off last year and now this happens and windows in the nba can close so quickly you just gotta wonder what this is gonna do i mean Jalen brown knows that he was on the trading block for kevin durant uh, again he's on the trading block every single time you know he's tweeting out his displeasure about this he comes up i believe after next year in free agency there's a really good chance they're gonna lose him it's just a shame that all this stuff happens. We'll see what happens with the Celtics this year. But now let's go to the top team in the regular season in the Eastern Conference last year. The Miami Heat, they can't be beat, except by the Celtics in the Conference Finals. But they were top dogs in the East, which was kind of surprising. We didn't really pick them to be at the top of the Eastern Conference at the beginning of last season. But Eric Spolstra still took them to the top and one went away from the NBA Finals. And Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo did, of course. That happens when Duncan Robinson forgot to shoot after he got his huge contract. Tyler Heroes got a new contract. Kyle Lowry was out for a ton of last season, and when he came back for the playoffs, he was not conditioned at all. That, I mean, we'll see what happens with Kyle Lowry. He's getting up there in age. But Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo are still there. But you've also got a team that doesn't look like they've improved much against the Eastern Conference that has improved. Yeah, you know, except at the very top of the Eastern Conference. Like, if you want to say that the top of the Eastern Conference is Miami, Boston, Milwaukee, and Philly, which I think is fair to say that those are the four most likely. They're kind of in their own group. The only one of those teams that really got better was Philly. And, you know, Miami is just that kind of team that somehow or other, they just kind of make it happen. You know, I mean, through um, really good coaching from Spolstra, through a really solid, you know, stable system that they have, like those players know they're not getting Eric Spolstra fired. They have to do what he tells them, you know, and that just goes a long way 
towards the kind of continuity that you see in Miami. And, you know, we know what Jimmy Butler is going to be. He's great, you know, and I don't, he's not young anymore, but I don't think he's so old that we can't expect him to do it again next year. Bam Adebayo, I don't know that I see a big leap for him offensively. I just don't know that's going to happen for him, but he's a great player still. It's really Kyle Lowry. If Kyle Lowry has anything left in the tank or not, I don't think last year was a really good indicator. You know, the injuries that he had, I think there was some personal stuff going on. Didn't necessarily mean that he doesn't have anything left. And if he does, then I think the Heat are still right up there with the teams that, you know, if the injury luck goes their way, can get to the finals. How about Hillbilly saying some good stuff about the Heat? How about that? Whoa. So those are the 15 teams from the Eastern Conference. We're going to make our picks for the eight teams who are going to make the Eastern Conference playoffs when we finish with the Western Conference, which we are getting to right now, the 15 teams there. The Phoenix Suns ran away with the Western Conference in the regular season, and then they had that epic collapse in Game 7 of the Conference Semifinals, just historically terrible. So it was the third seed Golden State Warriors who ran through the conference of the playoffs, their fourth championship of the era, Steph, Clay, Draymond, Steve Kerr, all that. But let's start with the bottom teams. And, I mean, let's start with these two teams, Houston and Oklahoma City. Let's start with Houston, because they were 15th last year. They get Jalen Green, who was the second pick last year. Jabari Smith is the third overall pick from Auburn. He joins him. But they also, Hillbilly, you might have picked them to finish last in the West, but consider this, they have Boban. Another fact. They do, and he is very, very large. That changes things. Yeah. He, you know, if they were uh, doing a modern version of the Princess Bride, Boban would definitely take Andre the Giant's place. It would be perfect for it. But anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, Houston's, you know, they, it's great to be a Rockets fan right now. I mean, I think that they're doing a really good job. They're doing what they are intending to do. Jalen Green looks like he's a legitimate star player, um, just needs some years and, you know, we'll see about Jabari, Meth. You know, there's every, he, he looks like he's just a good, solid 3 and D player that, you know, has a ton of athletic talent. We'll see if he can do any kind of playmaking. But yeah, I mean, everything looks good. It's just, they're so young, they're going to get destroyed regularly. And they're clearly going to tank. I mean, yeah. as soon as Jalen Green gets a hangnail, he's done for the year. They're obviously not trying to win. They're obviously trying to add Wembenyama next year to the screw. Oh, Wembenyama. Actually, we're at the bottom of the team, so let's talk about that for a second because... Let's do it. A lot of people for the past week, I guess, have watched Victor Wembenyama, who's a seven foot four, I believe, player from France, ball out when he came over to the States from Vegas. I think this was his like first time playing in the States or whatever. He's 18 years old. He is, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we could describe it accurately. You just have to go watch YouTube or whatever, because it's incredible. But Hillbilly showed me a couple months ago this, and I was like, yeah, yeah whatever. But I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is the real deal. Victor Wembenyama. I mean, he's not Chet. We're going to get to the Thunder in a second. But Chet, you know, seven feet, whatever, skinny, fragile. That's not Victor Wembenyamba, who's taller. I mean, you, you, you just describe him, Hillbilly, because it's just incredible. Yeah, well, I think LeBron called him an alien, which is, you know, oh, pretty. it's just, it, 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 it really does. And this is something that a lot of people have said, but I think a lot of people independently thought this. He, he just looks like somebody that, like, your eight-year-old brother would make on NBA Live. Or NBA 2K, I mean. 2K. Nobody plays NBA Live Yeah, anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> NBA 2K. You know, where it's just like, okay, let's make this guy seven foot five, but let's make him move like Kyrie Irving. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just insane. You know, I mean, his shot looked wonderful. I mean, and th the amazing thing is he had never played in the United States before. He's 18 years old, comes over to the United States, Plays by NBA rules, which he has never played a game of basketball by those rules in his life. 
an hour before the game, he's asking the referees about the rules. Like, and there are some big differences. And there was like one goaltending call that clearly he just in Europe, that would have been fine. And he's playing against grown men on that team. You know, that that G League team is designed to facilitate the growth of people like Scoot Henderson, who also looked absolutely incredible. And they do it by kind of showing them what the NBA is like with some of those, you know, big veteran players. And for Wembenyama to do that against them, the way that he did it with nothing really missing, it's remarkable to see, again, the consensus of opinion on the guy. Even all the, all the people that are usually curmudgeons about it, oh, we'll see, and all that, you know, he hasn't done anything yet. All of them are shutting up. Quit your whining. You know, which is just like, every, and everyone's kind of holding their breath. Please don't get hurt because everybody wants to see this happen. I mean, it's just incredible. Just go watch the YouTube. And Scoot Henderson, who you mentioned is in that game, is also just an incredible prospect who's probably going to go number two in the draft. Those are the one, two. Scoot Henderson looks like another Derrick Rose. With with more defense. Yeah, I thought he looked really good defensively. He is just an unstoppable. He's so explosive. Um, yeah, whoever gets it. I mean, that's why you're going to see so much tanking as everyone's predicting right now is because, you know, while they flatten the odds in the NBA lottery so that you have a much, you only have like a 14% chance of getting the number one pick, even if you have the very worst record. The bottom three teams all have. 14 percent right i mean that's how the pelicans got zion is they did that and the pelicans right. weren't like the worst team and they got him. but you have a i think it's like a 24 percent chance of getting one of the top two players and that is a better risk when those top two players are both transformational players I mean, it wouldn't surprise anyone if in 10 years from now, we've almost forgotten about when Benyama, almost like Greg Oden, because he got hurt so much. It just wouldn't be that big of a shock. People on the margin size-wise like that, that's, it can be difficult to stay healthy. And Scoot Henderson looks incredible. But it's going to give a lot of teams like the Rockets and the Thunder all the reason in the world to tank hard. <laughs> Oh yeah, which is what the NBA has tried to tried to avoid recently, which has worked somewhat. But this year, I don't, I don't know. One of the interesting things that could happen from this, and one of the consequences, they're going to try to get rid of their veterans. Like Houston's not going to trade Jalen Green as they tank, but they're going to try to trade away all of their veterans. Same thing. Well, maybe. Uh, oh. But same thing. The same thing with the Jazz, who still have a couple people to trade away too. They're going to have to have a market for those teams. So they're going to be, there's going to be a lot of veteran talent, good veteran players that the elite teams are able to pick up later in the season that could really change the way that the NBA looks as you're getting past the trade deadline. So, yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's literally that much of a seismic event, this one Benyama guy, that, that it, it's going to have those kind of ripple effects, I think. Yeah. I mean, well, wow. let's get back to the NBA, though. Thanks, goodness, that's over. And let's talk about Oklahoma City and Chet Holmgren. I mean, the Thunder, people were excited to watch the Thunder this year. And then, as I have said, I don't, you know, like this. I don't like saying this, but I knew it was going to happen. Chet Holmgren got injured. He was guarding LeBron James, and LeBron James does what LeBron James does to skinny boys. He injured him, so he's out for the year. Now, they've also got... Josh Giddy, who's the star of TikTok, Shy Gilgis Alexander, Lou Dort. These are good young guys, but as you said, they're going to be tanking this year. Yep. And Shay Gilgis Alexander could, could be a really interesting situation. He's still really young. I think he's probably 24, maybe 25, but he could become available. And, you know, at, at a decent price, I would imagine, because they might really just be trying to get rid of as much as they possibly can. I mean, they know this isn't their year anyways with Chet getting hurt. And, you know, with Chet, like getting hurt, that's it stinks for him, obviously. But, you know, another big problem that I noticed when he was playing in the summer league is what Kenny Lofton Jr. did to him, where he was just trucking him all over the court. I mean, he just put him anywhere he wanted him. 
Mm-hmm. And Holmgren just could not physically resist the man. That just really didn't look good. <laughs> but we'll we'll see. But yeah, I think that with the Thunder, they're they've got every excuse in the world to tank hard this time. So we'll see. So let's go to 13, the Trailblazers. Portland, who was a decent playoff team a couple years ago. CJ McCollum's gone. Damian Lillard's still there. They finished 27 and 55, though, but they just, they remind me of Indiana because how much longer is Damian Lillard still going to be with Portland? I mean, this is a Portland team that could decide to just tank like the Thunder and Rockets do, I would think. Yeah, it's interesting with Damian Lillard. You know, he's only like 500 points behind the all time Trailblazer point record, which is Clyde Drexler. Clyde the Glide. And supposedly that's important. Like, he's brought that up that he really wants that. Which is a weird thing to bring up, if, unless you're kind of signaling like, you know what, man, just let me get that, and then you can trade me off. Because, yeah, mm-hmm. other than that, I just don't know if the Blazers really have it this year, but we'll see. Damian Lillard's also just not the type, I think, that wants to be on a team that's tanking, so we'll see. Yeah. So what about the Kings, who finished 12th? They have the longest playoff drought. In major U.S. sports, they have not been to the NBA playoffs in 16 years. But they've got De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis. What do you think, Hillbilly, about the Sacramento Kings? And I I don't think they're trying to tank. I think they're going to try to win. I think Hmm. they're going to get in the play-in tournament. Wow. Bold move there. And they're going to have a parade. Uh, (laughs) Oh, yeah. Probably give out some rings. You remember how Minnesota celebrated when they won a play-in game. Right. I mean, imagine Sacramento. And you know what, man? If if the fans are that excited that they want to celebrate it, great. (laughs) I mean, there's nothing (laughs) wrong with that. It's just, you know, it's it's tough to put a winning team together in Minnesota. You know, not a lot of NBA players are really hungry to go there. But anyways, um, Sacramento does have, they've got enough to kind of compete this year and look good. Uh, Sabonis is a is a really good player. They they need for De'Aaron Fox to kind of he needs to figure out what he's doing. Um, last year was not a good step in his development. But then they also they got Keegan Murray in the draft, who looks like he's going to slide right into the NBA and play very well. So we'll see. I think that they've got a really good chance of getting into the play in and being very happy they got there. <laughs> how about that, Sacramento? But how about eleven? which is a team that doesn't just want to get into the play-in. The Los Angeles Lakers, everybody was talking about them last year, how much they were terrible. We refused because they didn't make the playoffs. They didn't make the play-in. They finished 11th. They have LeBron James. However, they also have Anthony Davis, who has not been healthy in years. Street clothes. Street clothes, Anthony Davis. And Wessel Westbrook, which... Jeez Louise. But they have a new coach, Darvin Ham, who you probably know as the top assistant with the Bucks. So, I mean, LeBron James, the Lakers cannot miss the, the playoffs this year, but it could happen, Hillbilly. They could miss it again. Oh, it, it definitely could. I mean, counting on Anthony Davis to be healthy is not a good bet. I feel bad for the guy, but he, there's something about the way like you can almost just see it when he's playing. He looks like this rambling wreck out there. Like he's just about to fall over just about any time. And it sucks because he's such a good player and to not see it. But LeBron James had one of his best years ever last year, which is just astonishing to say. And it didn't matter. I mean, he averaged over 30 points a game last year. That's a fact. Which is just incredible. Just an incredible year for him. They just don't have any depth at all because when they traded for Westbrook, they gave up all their good players like KCP, you know, Contavious Caldwell Pope. Well, they lost Caruso too. And they, they lost Caruso. They just bleed all of these good players and they're just stuck with one amazing player, one guy who's always hurt, and then the highest paid negative you can possibly have on your team. I mean, Westbrook is just not a good fit for the modern NBA. He's a liability to have out there. And they don't have anybody else around them. What I'm afraid of is that what I talked about earlier, that phenomenon of the teams that are tanking, getting rid of their veteran talent, that 
LA is going to be the recipient of that. That would really stink. Like, you know, it's like the Pacers need to get rid of a couple of players. You take on Westbrook, you're guaranteed to suck. You know, like you will tank with the best of them and you don't even have to sit your players. You put them out there, play them 40 minutes a game, you know, (laughs) and you're guaranteed to lose. So the Lakers are going to wind up with someone like Miles Turner or something like that from the Pacers to help them out because they just always seem to fall right backwards into it. We'll see with the Lakers. But how about a team that I think is going to tank this year? You finished 10th, lost in the play-in, the San Antonio Spurs because DeJounte Murray's gone. Pop is still there, but like not much else is there. Yeah, well, I think San Antonio is, I mean, I think it's actually pretty clear that they will get Wembenyama despite the 14% odds because that's what happens to the Spurs. I think the NBA brass just loves them so much that they reward them. You know, they tanked hard to get Tim Duncan. And it was just, it was that year where um, David Robinson was hurt and they tanked and lo and behold, they get him, you know, Tim Duncan. They did the same thing with David Robinson when they got him. You know, I just, I think San Antonio, they're going to, the NBA is going to say they want him going to San Antonio and that's where he's going to go, is my prediction. Other than that, the Spurs are awful this year. So sad. Keldon Johnson had a good last year, or a good year last year. He looks like he's going to be a good player. Vassell could still be pretty good, but other than that, they've just got nothing. I, I can't believe that Pop is actually going to go sit on the sidelines for 82 games. Well, he knows he's going to get Wembenyama next year, so. Is uh, Adam uh, Silver already told him? Ah, uh, yes, that is okay. Conspiracy theorist, Hillbilly. Are you sure? Let's go to a team though that's not going to tank and that should significantly improve, and that is the other Los Angeles team, the Clippers, who get Paul George and Kawhi Leonard is going to play. We had no clue what was going on with Kawhi Leonard last year, but he didn't play. He's going to play this year, so everybody's got them as title contenders. Everybody's saying this is the year. For the Los Angeles Clippers. And they also have John Wall. John Wall's older, but he, I mean, John Wall did pretty decent last year. So the Clippers, are they a contender this year, Hillbilly? Yeah, I think they're actually going to be my number one team in the West this year. Morning, morning. Well, they're so deep. They've just got, they've got so, so many. They're, they're kind of like Toronto where they just have everybody that's six foot eight and good that's in the NBA is on that team. You know, they're just completely loaded. And then Kawhi Leonard, you know, if, if he's playing on a team that deep, then he can play like 40 games a year during the regular season and play like 25 minutes a game and they'll be fine. And if Kawhi Leonard is fresh for the NBA playoffs, I think they are probably the best team in the West given what's happening in Golden State right now. <laughs> wow. We will get to that. Don't you worry. We will talk about what is going on in Golden State. But let's go to New Orleans because Zion is back and he looks slimmer. How about that? Zion a little slimmer, which is what they needed. The Pelicans finished eighth in the West. They made it to the playoffs last year. They lost to the Suns in the first round. But if you remember that series, Jose Alvarado. Grand Theft Alvarado. Gave Chris Paul some major fits. And you got to remember, they've got CJ McCollum and Brandon Ingram on that team. I've got to think that the Pelicans, it is the West, but they look significantly improved just on Zion alone. I, it's a great time to be a Pelicans fan because their team right now is absolutely loaded. CJ McCollum, as you said, was a fantastic fit for them last year. And he just kind of brings that steadying veteran calm presence that the team really needed. Brandon Ingram is an absolute star. He's really like a poor man's Kevin Durant. They hit the absolute jackpot with Herb Jones last year. You know, this is a second round pick that they got. And he's starting almost immediately. And in the playoffs, he looked like an absolute monster defensively, and now his shot is looking better. Jonas Valanciunas playing really well. And then to all that, you add Zion Williams, who is one of the most powerful forces in the NBA. I mean, he's like a, another Giannis, you know, just that unstoppable 
explosion to the rim that he has. And the depth that they have is just incredible. You know, they've had the great starting lineup, the great depth. We mentioned Grand Theft Alvarado. And, you know, it's the way that he would steal the ball from Chris Paul was some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen. Like he was stalking him and hunting him (laughs) and he would just swoop in from behind and take it. And Paul just got so mad. And so, you know, upset about it. Mm-hmm. It's just beautiful to watch. But yeah, they just have one great player after another. And on top of all that, they are like third or fourth in draft capital. Like they've got more draft picks coming up in the next 10 years than anybody other than I think it's Houston and Oklahoma City. This is true. So it's just it's astonishing what they have. They could easily turn those draft picks into a good, another good player to put on this team this year. I think the sky's the limit for them. If Zion can stay healthy and you look at just how good this team is in so many different ways, I think they could be a good finals. Wow. Wow. How about that in New Orleans? Pelicans, they don't know what contender is like in New Orleans for their basketball team. They'll believe. Mm. That's interesting. All right, let's go to seventh, though. And that team that we mentioned had a little celebration when they won that play-in game against the Clippers last year. The Minnesota Timberwolves, who who did lose to the Grizzlies in the first round four games to two, Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards, and D'Angelo Russell. That was who they had last year. And they add Rudy Gobert. Now... That, on paper, makes you look better, but, like, how do you think that fit is when you already have Carl Anthony Towns and you add Rudy Gobert? Well, that's their huge gamble. I mean, it's certainly unorthodox, but I think when you are up in Minnesota, you kind of have to be unorthodox, and you have to hope that you kind of look out on, you know, some kind of cheat code that that could be. I mean, they're going to have two seven-footers out there. Tons of size. Gobert fills a huge hole for them defensively. Carl Anthony Towns, despite being the best shooting big man in league history, at least according to him, is not a rim protector or not a particularly good one. He's still seven feet tall. So, I mean, that counts for a whole lot in defense by itself. But adding Rudy Gobert is huge. Rudy Gobert is really good in the pick and roll. I think he's going to work with D'Angelo Russell really well with that. And then Anthony Edwards looks like he's getting ready to just explode and be so good. There's so many good young players in the NBA right now. It's just, I think this is the most talent I have ever seen the NBA have. How about that? And the young talent is just taking over. And Anthony Edwards is part of it. He's just so good. Defensively, last year, he shut John Morant down when he's playing John Morant. and. That's just impossible to do. (laughs) No one can stay in front of him. And then his offensive game looks fantastic. I think they're going to be great this year. It's just, it's going to be weird running two seven footers out there and we'll kind of see how that works. But they should be, you know, right in that group, right below the top contenders. How about that? If Anthony Edwards can keep his mouth shut on Instagram. He can. (laughs) I don't think he can. Oh, jeez. All right. Well, that's the Timberwolves. On to the Nuggets. And if if Giannis isn't your favorite player, Hillbilly, I think it's Nikola Jokic, the back-to-back MVP who has just carried the team on his back because Jamal Murray has been out. Michael Porter Jr. has been injured. But as of now, they're they're getting those two guys back. They finished sixth last year. But you add Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. to Nikola Jokic, and people are really liking this Nuggets team, Hillbilly. Are you liking this Nuggets team? Yeah, they didn't just add the players back that they got back from injury either. They add, made some other pretty big additions. Contavious Caldwell Pope, who we talked about earlier, one of the players that left the LA Lakers, is just killing him right now because he's a big 3 and D wing. Like You need as many of those as you can possibly get, meaning he hits the three-pointer, he plays great defense and he's a big guy. That's exactly what you need. Picking him up is huge for them. Bruce Brown, who in Brooklyn really made a name for himself being a great all around player, shoots a really high percentage three pointer, but low volume, but a fantastic defensive player. You add those guys to the people coming back. 
you know, you have to remember before all of these injuries happened, which was a long time ago now, I really do think the Nuggets were on their way to being a championship contender that year. I mean, they were destroying everybody. Um, as soon as they picked up Aaron Gordon that year, that's all they could do was win. And then they lose Jamal Murray. They lose Monte Morris. They lose Michael Porter Jr. They just didn't have anybody else out there to help with Jokic. But them being back, it's huge. The big problem that they have, I'm not worried about Jamal Murray. He looks great. He's going to be good. Michael Porter Jr.'s injury is a back injury. And he's had them over and over and over again. And it's like a ticking time bomb. That kind of an injury is is the way it's described. Uh, I think there's a really good chance, and I hope this isn't the case, but without him, they just kind of, with Michael Porter Jr., I think they're as good as anybody in the West. They're right up there with the Clippers, even though I take the Clippers over them. But without Michael Porter Jr., they're just kind of in that next rung below. So that's the Nuggets, who look much better this year. But let's go to the team. That doesn't. If you thought we were done with the teams that are tanking, we're not. This is going to be the final one. The Utah Jazz, who have been really good recently. Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. But I think, as you have said on this podcast, that tension there finally just... Well, they got traded. So Donovan Mitchell's gone. Rudy Gobert's gone. And so are the Jazz chances of the playoffs, I would say. Uh, Quite intentionally, too. And the haul that they got for Rudy Gobert in particular is just insanity. I mean, they basically got five first round picks from them. They got four actual first round picks, and then they got Kessler, who was their first round pick this year. So it's really like they got five. Then they get a ton for Donovan Mitchell. They are going to be horrible. It's just incredible that, you know, the way we're doing this is we're going up the rankings from last year. And that we are on the Jazz now at number five. They almost won 50 games last year. Yeah. And they're going to be lucky if they win 20 this year. They are going for Wembenyama. And I think yes, they, they would are. consider that lucky if they only won that, that, that few games because that's what they're trying to do. So, yeah, it's total tank for the, for the Jazz. Oh, yeah. But not the Dallas Mavericks who have Luka Doncic. And the Mavericks finished fourth last year. That series with the Suns, it went to seven games. We all know what happened in Game 7 of that series. Luka Doncic returns. Spencer Dinwiddie, Tim Hardaway Jr., Christian Wood. I think when you surround Luka with those players, you've got a pretty decent basketball team, Hillbilly. Even in the Western Conference. Yeah, I think when you... They don't have any stars, but the players that they have are smart players to put around Luka. You know, basically everybody can hit the three. Everybody can, they're all catch and shoot players. And Luca can handle the ball for 40 minutes a game. He's fine doing that. He doesn't look like he's going to slow down. I hope to God he's not injury prone, but he just, he kind of seems like he's not. You know, I don't, there's just something about that guy's aura. And they didn't have, you know, any more talent on the team last year than they did this year. Jalen Brunson did leave, but I think getting uh, Woods, Kind of makes up for that a bit. Spencer Dinwiddie's back. He was a big part of it last year. They are set to be the same team that they were last year. And remember, we talked about just how good Boston was and how historically good that defense was. The defense for the Mavericks was just a shade below them. If it was 105.2 per 100 minutes for the Celtics, it was like 105.4. For the Mavericks. Like they were also at a historically good defensive pace. That's a lot of numbers. They've got all those pieces back. Jalen Brunson wasn't the reason their defense was good. He's not a plus defender. So they should be back in that same spot. Doncic, he's, you know, as I'm going to say later, he's going to be my pick for the MVP. What? Just because they are going to put everything through him. He is going to touch the ball on every single possession. So many opportunities, and he's so good that I I think Dallas is going to be right up there with the best teams. How about that? I say that, like I said, that Dallas is going to be good even in the West, like they would be in the East. Like both of these conferences are just, I mean, they're really good right now. But let's go to number three, because number three is going to take some time for us. The Golden State Warriors. Uh Uh-oh. The defending NBA champions. That's a whole thing to talk about. But we're going to talk about 
Draymond Green. If you don't know what's going on with Draymond Green, who has been with the Warriors through their run of championships, I will just... Okay, so last week, the Warriors are having practice. We hear, coming out of the Warriors' practice, that Draymond Green... Let's, I think we heard that he punched Jordan Poole. Now, what we've heard out of the Warriors camp is that Jordan Poole, he's got a contract negotiation coming up. So he's kind of come into camp, you know, a little not in the best mood, Jordan Poole. And you've got Draymond Green, who has been known for his antics. So we hear about that. We're like, okay, whatever. Then, a couple days later, on Friday, I believe, video comes out, TMZ, somehow they got it, they always do, released the video of the practice where Draymond Green, like, throws a punch where he's trying to take Jordan Poole's head off. Like, he went full body on him. Like, that was not good. So, we haven't heard what's gonna happen to Draymond right now, but Hillbilly, Like, we saw the video, like, something needs to happen to, like, he needs to be suspended games, Draymond Green. Like, you can't have that, like, I don't know. What are your thoughts on this situation? Well, I think there's a video of it, so he's probably going to get suspended because that's the way that it typically goes. When there's no video, it's much harder to get the suspension. It's kind of like we don't know what violence looks like unless we actually see it. I mean, we already knew that he had punched him, you know? Well, we thought it was bad, and then the video comes out, and it's like, it's worse. It was worse than just the typical punching. I mean, that's, who knows what Draymond's like uh, personally, but he just kind of seems like he's just the kind of guy that if you were playing pickup basketball and he comes on the court, you just go home. I mean, why do you, why, I don't want to be punched in the groin. I don't want to be punched in the face. I don't want to be tripped. I, I just don't want to, I don't know. It's a shame to say it, but that's how he plays, and that's how he is. And you can argue that he's, first off, I don't think that the Warriors would have gotten to this point without Draymond Green, but 2016, Draymond Green got suspended because he did whatever to LeBron James. Like, you could argue the Warriors lost that finals because of Draymond Green. Oh, they probably did. I mean, you know, he was out for the rest of that game, and then he was suspended for the next game, and it took Mm -hmm. every inch of effort that the Cavaliers could muster in order to win, even with that happen. So I don't, you know, I, I, that, I think it's actually pretty clear he cost them the finals mm-hmm. there. And, you know, he's like, if they lose pool because of this pools looking incredible in the preseason, um, he looks like a legit perennial all-star. It would suck to lose him because of Draymond green. Who's, clearly in decline at this point it's interesting i if i had to bet right now i think he gets traded pretty quickly i just the the whole him taking some time away uh just makes me wonder if he's ever really coming back to that locker room or maybe not i mean maybe they'll be just fine and everybody will be happy i mean you know the person that he punched in the groin in the in that finals was lebron james and they're now best friends i mean lebron james is at his wedding there's all those pictures of lebron james Mm. at his wedding he punched him in the groin <laughs> and he still came to his wedding. So maybe Jordan pulls, you know, maybe they'll be fine. And it's all overblown. There's just something about him being gone from the team right now. That just seems like there's a chance. Maybe he's going to get traded, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see with that. And we are recording this Monday night. So if anything happens between now and Wednesday, that's why we're not talking about it, but we're reg- disregarding that. What do you think about the defending champion Golden State Warriors on the court this season? Well, they were going to be my pick to, to represent the West before all this stuff happened. Stinger. And they're still, I mean, they're still so good. But losing a guy, if, if they did, like if he's, if Draymond Green is just checked out because he is so furious that he is not going to get the same kind of money as Jordan Poole, I think that is just the kind of thing that can take the edge off the team and kind of take them down a wrong. But other than that, they are so deep. They are so good. They have so many players that, I I mean, when you look at, we talked about Jordan Poole, looks like he's getting ready to take another step, even though he's already 
all-star level or, or not maybe all-star level but getting close to it well you got guys like kuminga and moody wiseman looks incredible in preseason they've just got all like four players that could make massive leaps next year and play along with curry and clay thompson who's another year removed from all those injuries they could be absolutely incredible i still don't think they can stop Giannis. that's why i would pick the pucks over them okay. however <laughs> Anybody else, I just don't, they've got an answer to just about everybody. I mean, I think the Clippers could, the Clippers and them full strength would be a great matchup, but this thing that's happening with Draymond, it's it's just a kind of distraction. If he's not dialed in, if he's not a happy camper, it could be the kind of thing that sinks him. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Warriors actually bit the bullet, made the move and traded him. Because you could get good value for Draymond Green mm-hmm. right now. And I don't know that that will be true next year. Yeah. We'll see what happens with the Warriors, because that's really interesting. But let's go to number two, a surprise number two in the West last year, the Memphis Grizzlies, who have that young core, guys like John Moran, as we said, Sharon Jackson Jr., Desmond Bain, they all took major leaps last season. And the thing was, John Morant was injured for a bunch of that season. You could argue he's their best player. Their record was better without him than with him. Like, so they also lost the Warriors in the conference semifinals. but. It's an improved West, and the Grizzlies didn't really add anybody, but you've got to think those young players are going to keep getting better. Yeah, I mean, all the play, everyone they play is is young. It seems like everybody's 25 and and under, and they've got a strong bench. They keep shedding good players. Like, that just keeps happening because they can't, like, they make so many good draft picks that they can't keep paying everybody. Like, the Sixers benefited from it this year when they picked up DeAnthony Melton. Because the Grizzlies just couldn't pay him. They didn't have room for him. Anthony Melton's fantastic. He's a defensive monster. And a you know halfway deep, decent offensive guard. And that just happens because they have so many good players. I just don't know that they've got the star power, though, outside of Morant to do it. And Morant worries me every time he drives the lane. He's so small. And mm-hmm. he, dri- he just he drives the lane like he's Zion Williamson, you know? But he's not. <laughs> And as great as he is, I worry about him. And now Jaron Jackson's injured and he's huge for them because he's basically their rim protection. And he's incredible when he's in there at rim protection, but he's out until I think at least January, uh, which is a, that's an issue. And it's, it's again, it's enough to kind of keep it where I don't think they're in that group with Golden State and Denver and the Clippers, but they're, they're right below that, I think. Yeah, they're really young, so they've got time, definitely, in the West, the Memphis Grizzlies. But let's go to number one, the Phoenix Suns, who just, uh, they stormed through the West in the regular season, 64-18. and They beat the Pelicans in the first round, but that was a tough series of the first round against the eighth seed. And, of course, the Mavericks, who they just collapsed. I mean, it was just horrible that game seven it wasn't close in the first two minutes of the game it was awful and then you've got this off season you know the whole deal with robert sarver having to sell the team now i mean i don't think that's really going to be an issue on the court but you've got chris paul who is on the court who was very much exposed to the playoffs who's another year older so the suns ran through the west but hopefully i gotta say i don't think that's gonna happen again this year I wouldn't be surprised if they pick, put up some good numbers again in the regular season. I don't think they're going to win 64 games again, but I wouldn't be surprised if they put up some good numbers, but they were exposed. And Chris Paul is a problem. All Apparently, all you have to do is hassle him and pressure him all the way up the court on every play, and he will just collapse. Because he, I, I just don't know that he's really got it in him anymore. And it's, it's really, it's, it's not just that. You know, DeAndre Ayton last year, he was picked out by Monty Williams. Coach of the year, Monty Williams, makes a massive mistake of publicly picking on one of his players. And you just cannot do that. And then they tell Ayton, like, you've got to go find your money. We're not going to make you an offer. You go somewhere else. You get an offer. You bring it back, and we'll pay you because he was a restricted free agent. And so then that happens. Ayton is not a happy camper. That sucks. They're also going to lose Jay Crowder because he's he's been voluntarily excused from the team. He doesn't have to come because they know that they're trading. And he's super pissed about it. 
and it, they're not going to get anything for him because of how it looks. They know he's being traded. So, yeah, they just got so many different things. It's going to be a tough year for the Suns relative to where they've been the last two seasons. But, you know, they're still... They, they've still got some really good players on that team. The like Kale Bridges is fantastic. Devin Booker is for real. He's a legit all pro level player or all NBA level player. So they, it's not like they're going to sink down into the, towards the bottom, but it's difficult to project them having the spine to get through the playoffs and back into the finals. And that's just interesting. The mismanagement really, of the team from a front office standpoint. Maybe that has something to do with all the inner stuff, but that... I think it, I think that stuff leaks down. I mean, you just look at how it happens. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm unfortunate enough to be a recovering Washington Commanders fan. Ugh. You know, oh, you left owners, them like I did? Man, that was rough. Bad owners just stink. They ruined the team. I mean, the Knicks should be one of the best teams in the NBA every year. But they just have this owner that ruins it, and Sarver was one of them, and you know, good riddance to him. But I think it does have an effect on the team. Yeah. So that's the Suns who finished number one. So you've bared with us through our previews for all 30 teams, but now we're going to get to the good stuff. We are making some predictions. So we've got playoff teams in each conference, all eight, our picks for the finals, and MVP. Big fact incoming! So... Let's start with our playoffs teams at each conference. So let's start with the Easter Conference. So I'll go, I'll go first with my eight teams of the Easter Conference. I will go from bottom to top. So from eight to one for my teams of the Easter Conference. I chose for this year the Cavs, Hawks, Raptors, Celtics, Heat, Nets, Sixers, and Bucks, which I know you like. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just... You'd be a fool not to. Okay, yeah. All right, what about your eight, Hillbilly? Well, so I'll go in uh, reverse order from okay. that. I'll, obviously, I've got the Bucks number one, then I've got the Sixers, then I've got the Celtics, then I've got the Heat, then I've got the Nets, the Raptors, the Cavs, and the Hawks. Wow, we really didn't change much from our two. No. But yeah, I mean, those are the best eight teams, I think. I mean, especially when you look at the bottom. You've got the Hawks and the Cavs down there. The other teams are the Bulls. I think the Bulls are going to digress this year. And then the Hornets, ugh. the Knicks, I don't think are going to do anything. Or the Wizards, like you said, too. They, they, the, the Wizards and the Knicks have zero chance of contending for the finals. They, 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 it, there's just no real possibility of that happening, which is awful for their fans. But yeah, I think that it's kind of... I mean, the Bucks are the only team that don't need for something to happen. Like all the, except stay healthy. That's it. If they stay healthy, they're the best team in the league because of Giannis. Yeah. Of course. Well, we'll see what happens. But that's the East. All right. I'll let you go first here with the West, Hillbilly. Who are your eight teams to make the playoffs in the Western Conference? In the West, and now I have. At number eight, I've got the Pelicans, even though I could see them going way higher than that. But when I did these, that's, that's what I came up with. Timberwolves above them, then the Grizzlies, and then the Suns. And actually now, I think I would probably put the Suns probably below the Timberwolves. And then the Mavericks at number four. And number three, I've got the Nuggets. And I think really with number three, that's where you start seeing the teams that it's more than likely going to be one of these three teams. The Nuggets, the Warriors, or the Clippers, with the Clippers being number one and the Warriors being number two. That's what I've got for my top three. I put I put Nuggets one, but Nuggets, Warriors, Clippers. Like I think those three teams. Nuggets at number one. Yeah, because you look at the regular season, it's not really the best teams. Like where the the Phoenix Suns were number one, and I don't. I mean, I might have picked them to win yeah. last year. I mean, but the Jazz, the Jazz won 50 games last year. <laughs> Yeah, the Hawks, you remember that year they were number yeah. one in the East and they got swept or whatever, you know, it's just the regular, I do my regular season predictions different from my finals because that's how it always works. The right. one seed, it's not, you know, last year was the 2v3 seed, it's not always the one seeds. But let me keep, let me keep going. So Nuggets, Warriors, Clippers, uh, number four, I picked the Suns, five, I've got the Grizzlies, put Pelicans at six, Mavericks seven. And I had to do it, Hillbilly. I had to. I couldn't. 
I had to put LeBron James in the playoffs, so wow. I put the Lakers at eight. But I, I did put the Timberwolves, and that was really hard because I think the Timberwolves are going to be good. I just don't know about how Rudy Gobert fits in there. But they're, they showed they're really good last yeah, year. But you're, I mean, you're right. It's, it's one of the bigger gambles because it's so unorthodox. So it could be great. It could be bad. I applaud them for taking the gamble. So I just, I mean, I had to put LeBron James in there. Like the NBA cannot go, cannot keep going without LeBron James in the playoffs. So those are our playoff picks. But now our two teams for the finals. Big game alert. So I guess I'll go first with my two teams in the finals. In the East, Hillbilly is not going to like this. Huh. I have got the Philadelphia 76ers, and I will tell you why. Because, actually, I'm gambling here. If Joel Embiid stays healthy, I think he's going to be incredible next to James Harden. And I think that if any year James Harden's going to win the final or make the finals, it's got to be this year because he's getting older. You've also got guys like Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris on that team. Like, you've got depth on that team, the Sixers, which you need to make a run in the playoffs. And the Bucs, like you said, really don't. Of course, they have Giannis, which, I mean, kind of disregards all that depth talk. But if any players on the the Bucs go down, any secondary players, really, that's going to hurt them. And with the Sixers, of course, if Embiid and Harden go down, That's really going to hurt them. But if Tobias Harris goes down in the playoffs, they might still have a shot. So I've got the Sixers. And then my other team is the Clippers because I know Kawhi's coming back from injury. Paul George is too. But that team, and they've got John Wall. Who knows about John Wall? He's old now, but he has been playing they decent. Don't, they don't need that much from John Wall. They really don't. No. They, they've got that Reggie Jackson. They've got Kawhi can bring it up. Paul George can bring the ball up. They, it, It's fine. If John Wall is a complete washout, it really, I, I would still pick them right in the same spot. Sixers and Clippers, I think, both have depth. And I think that is really important to make the finals. So that's my two teams. And I've got the Sixers winning the title. So there you go. These are facts. Wow. Well, I hope you're right. I, I love Joel and Mead. I think it'd be great to watch him with the trophy I mean, up the, there. The, the Philly fans would just be terrible. Oh, but they burned the city down. And they've got the Eagles, who are really good right now. But I yeah. know. It would be too much for them to handle. <laughs> no, it would. But I've got the Sixers. All right, Hillbilly, how about you? Who are the Bucks going to face in the finals? I have the Bucks playing the Clippers as well now. Oh. Because I, I think you're right. I mean, as we, as we talk about so often, or at least I talk about it, I guess I'm complaining about it, but injuries pick the winners so much in the NBA over the last five years. It's just, and depth is so huge being able to sustain, you know, and they've got so many six foot eight players that are just incredible defenders that they can just throw at you, you know, between Batum and Morris and uh, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and just all these guys that are right at that size that are so good. It's, it's tough to overlook them. So. But if this thing with Draymond just blows over, I think the Warriors are the better team, though. They could be. That's something. All right. So final thing we're going to predict here. We made our picks. Are you? Who are you picking for the to win the finals? We all oh, know. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know why I asked that question. Do better. That was silly. Giannis gets MVP again for the uh, the finals, and it's fun. Uh-huh. Okay. So final thing we're going to predict here on this NBA preview podcast, MVP, most valuable player. Nikola Jokic has won it twice. If he won it again, he would be the first three-peat MVP since Larry Bird. That's not going to happen, though, because the writers pick it and they'll be like, that's the thing. You know, if they actually picked, Jokic could be the best player this year again. But if they actually pick the best player, I mean, LeBron James would have so many MVPs, you know, from back in his day. Like, it's not actually the best player. Yeah, I mean, Giannis was the best player last year. Everybody. Yeah. And Michael Jordan should have gotten 10 of them. At least. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah, that, but that's just not the way that it works. And that's fine. Jokic got him in, in large part because he had to do so much to keep that mm-hmm. team afloat with the injuries. 
he should be able to take the regular season a lot easier this time, which is going to make it a lot less likely he gets MVP. It's Luca that is going to have to be the engine of his team. Like almost 100% of the offense will go through him. And that just sets him up for an MVP. He's already been in the discussion. I think the only thing that would really get in the way of that is if Embiid just has an immense year. And that's who I picked. I picked Embiid. I mean, that's the gamble is he needs to stay healthy. And if he does, I just think he's going to be incredible this year with yeah. James, with, with, a, with a full offseason of James Harden, which I think is going to do a lot for that team. And, and in all fairness, you know, if I was if I had a vote for the MVP, it would be Embiid over Doncic most years because Embiid is a two way player. He's elite defensively and offensively. Jokic is only okay defensively. You know, you don't have that many players like Embiid who changes the very nature of what the offense does that's opposing him because of what he can do at the rim. There are not that, that many of them. Um, so, you know, he, he's a great vote for it, and I hope he gets it if he's healthy. So there you go. MVP, NBA Finals, NBA Playoffs, all 30 teams we have just predicted here on the Xanders Facts Podcast. So you have got all your NBA facts from the only NBA preview full of facts. How about that? So parting thoughts, Hibbley, and I think I'll just mention this to you. Just taking a look at the league, the league looks incredibly deep. We're not just talking about one conference that's loaded. We're talking about two. And even looking at the teams at the bottom, especially in the Eastern Conference, the Pistons and the Magic, I think, are going to be fun to watch just because of the young players they've got. And the Thunder, I like watching Josh Giddy, and the Rockets, too. Like, I think all the and those teams we know are going to be good later too. They're not just going to be you know mediocre. Like I think this league is as deep as it has been in a long time. Well, I think a good gauge of it is how happy you imagine you would be if you were a fan of the team. Yep. And there are very few teams in the league right now that I wouldn't be at least okay with where my team is. You know, like if I'm a Wizards fan, I'm getting a little sick of this. Like. Yeah. Every single year, we're in the same exact place. You know, the Knicks, same way, you know. But, like, everybody else, even if you're a Nets fan, if there is such a thing. Fake fans. Like, you're still, like, you still have one of the most talented teams in the league. If you're a Rockets fan, okay, we're going to suck, but we're going to be awesome. If you're a Detroit fan, the same thing. It's just amazing the influx of talent and watching them get better as the NBA gets better at bringing the young players up, training them properly. The, the talent is just through the roof. And all of this before we have possibly the best prospect in NBA history coming in next year with a number two who's just right behind them. It's an exciting time for the NBA. Yeah. I mean, and you look at the teams who you might not want to be fans of right now, the Spurs, the Jazz, the Wizards, the Knicks. If those teams tank and get the first or second pick, you're immediately going to be super excited about your team. Well, and that's the thing. That's what I was saying. Like, if I was a Jazz fan, I'm, I'm thrilled right now. You know, like, okay, sure, we blew it up. We're not going to win 50 games this week, but we got the mother load for Rudy Gobert. Like, they have so many draft picks now. Danny Ainge is a very capable general manager. I'd be perfectly happy if I was a Utah Jazz fan right now. All right. Now, Billy, any final thoughts as we embark on the 76th season of the NBA? Just, just that, that it's going to be, it's going to be a great year. There's, it's going to be really exciting. So many, so many teams that, you know, I want to watch that have no chance of winning even like I, I can't wait to watch the Pistons play this year. I think they're going to be a lot of fun. It's just, there are going to be very few bad games. I think. Yeah. What a year to make league pass much cheaper. The NBA. Indeed. Uh, that? <laughs> All right. So there you go. That is our Xander's Facts 2022-23 NBA season preview. Again, the NBA season begins Tuesday with the opening night doubleheader on TNT. The games are also on ESPN, ABC, NBA TV, and League Pass all season long as we gear up for the playoffs, which begin in the spring. All right, Hillbilly. Our Xander's Facts. Senior NBA analyst. 
Thanks once again for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Xander's Facts. So there you have it. Thanks once again to Hillbilly, our Xander's Facts NBA analyst, for coming on the podcast to preview the NBA season. And with that, this long podcast comes to a close. That is it for episode 78 of Xander's Facts Podcast. Thank you all for listening. And remember, before we go, I just got to remind you, if you liked all the facts you heard, on this week's edition of the podcast, remember to follow the Xander's Facts Podcast, download this episode, episode 78, rate and review the podcast, go on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at Xander's Facts, and then tell all your friends, remember, spread the facts, Xander's Facts Podcast, check out all the Xander's Facts links on the link tree, check out Xander's Weekend Facts, and check out Xander's Facts on YouTube. This episode is also going to be available on YouTube. So check out Xander's Facts on YouTube. So there you have it. That is episode 78. We are going to have a brand new edition as well next week, episode 79 of the podcast. So check that out next week. So that is it. That is a wrap on episode 78 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all with episode 79 next week. (laughs) 